firstly, Stuart and Lyndall, are you guys able just to paint a little bit of a picture of where we are at the moment? I can say we're at your kitchen table, but Lyndall, do you want to tell us a little bit about the area? Um, well, we are on our property, Dimboola, and it's about 15 kilometres out of Palamalawar, a little village, and 50 k's from Moree, um, which is our local uh, shopping and business centre. Um, we've been here in this area for about 21 years, 22 years, stewed a little bit longer. Um, yeah, I don't know. What can you add? Stuart? Uh, near a little old siding called Melgar, which was a grain corp delivery uh, centre. And it's it's part of what they call the Golden Triangle in this part of the world. And it's predominantly cereal cropping. Uh, not, not a lot of livestock here. We're on the very east of where that is. And um, yeah, it's probably been farmed for some time. 100% cropping since uh, wheat boom in the late 70s. There hasn't, hasn't been a lot of stock around here. What was it that brought you guys to the area? I think it was, the, for me anyway, it was the opportunity um, in the late, late 90s. Uh, dryland cotton was really booming. There was a lot of work for contract farming. And more is just, and still is today, I believe, a great community that will support people that are willing to have a go. And yeah, we, we were turned up here with no paradigms because I'm not from a grain production background or from a livestock background. And yeah, we had some um, extended family that we'd come out and I'd come out and did some work for as harvest and sowing, et cetera, and sort of got liked it from that. Hmm. The Maury like, community is definitely interesting. I came up last, well, I've come up a few times for the races, um, but more recently last year with the young Aggies. And it's just such an awesome, vibrant community of young people. And it seemed to be really keen on coming back. It feels like there's a real injection of youth kind of in the area. Yes, yeah, it's, it's certainly, it's a large, large attraction on many fronts. It's the corporate farming that's happening in the district, um, creates a larger skill set that's required right, right down to very large farming families and then all the, um, other businesses that are happening in the district and with inland rail coming through, hopefully there'll be a further because we will have a precinct, which is in a modal hub happening. So there'll be a lot more in the future, hopefully. More and more opportunities. And so you're from Canada. Whereabouts are you from? No, Linda, no, you're from Canada. I'm from Canada. Yeah. yeah. Uh, well, my family was originally from Sydney yeah. um, and then um, born in Tamworth, but then did most of my well, teenage growing up years in Canada. Yeah, so, um, and then met Stuart in Armadale later on after Were school you both and studying? uni. No, no, no. Um, I went to Orange Ag and did an ag commerce degree and then I had a job at an accountancy firm in Armadale and, yeah, met Stuart there. <laughs> so. And what about you, Stuart? Am I right in thinking you, did you finish school the whole way through or did you decide it wasn't? You're a bit too advanced. Yeah, I think for once it. you once you learn how to learn, then um, I think I think you're better off, and you know what you want to do, and you've got a plan of how you're going to get there or attempt to get there, which which we I did. So yeah, got out of there as soon as I could. Really, tell me more about that. What was the what was the plan, and and what did it kind of look like to you at 15 or 16? Uh, I think it was to it was to make money in agriculture, predominantly around the um, livestock or cropping. And that there were opportunities if you worked hard and, and aligned yourself with the right people yep. that, that I could see would, would advance me a lot quicker than spending those extra years in the tertiary education. And were those opportunities for you in and around the family farm or did you have to go external? Uh, started off shearing up at, around Longreach. Did you? Up that way um, and then came back around the home country and then worked for some people down around Balatta. And out here, not far from here. And um, yeah, got with the right clique of people and community. That's where we, that's where I thought, you know, I could really make some advances in some of our plans, what, what, we, what we had way back then. Yeah, wow. But also your um, father, parents who have sheep and cattle up between Guy and Inverell, um, had bought country out here. Mm -hmm. So just next door to us here. 
So you did have an insight. Yeah, no, an understanding of what it, what it was about. Yeah, yeah great. This sort of area. And so, Linda, did you meet Stuart when he was the shearer or at what stage? <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you'd come back home and you were working at home and out here. Um, and Stuart, had, I, I'm a little bit older than Stuart, um, so he only just turned 21. Um, when I met Stuart, at a, we just met at a course. It was nothing. <laughs> and of course, and yeah, I was just working in the family business at home. And as Linda said, we had country out here and back around in rural Gaira and uh, decided that it was what we call the Christmas Day factor was always going to be a better Christmas Day if I wasn't working in the, within the business. So we went out on our own. That's so interesting. And I, and I think I was only, oh, I've been, I think about it a lot this time of year as well, because I've done a few different harvests with mates, families and things over the years. And one of the things that a friend has said to me once was he, he wished he'd go on the corporate farming route because he kind of dreaded Christmas because he hated that time of year. It was, yeah, the relationship with his father had kind of blown up and you turn up at Christmas and, and pretend it's all happy. But <laughs> that's right. That's a big decision though. Yeah, big, big decision. And then, as I said, found the right support and community out here. And we, um, by then I met Lyndall, we started off contracting and uh, share farming and some leasing and uh, sort of contracting in a, in a way for absentee landholders where we would do the majority of everything, nearly a full farm management service. What well, wasn't quite as sophisticated as that, but we would try to provide everything that they needed. And that gave us some scale when we were very small on the little bit of land that we were share farming and owned, that we would buy all the inputs for all the different people I was contracting for, and that would get us a, better, a bit more economies of scale. Gotcha, and help them out as well that they were yeah. getting. Because if you were, if you're in a level of control of all the inputs going in, then you could make the contracting a lot more seamless and a lot more efficient, as well as getting better deals because they're scale. So that really enabled us to to um, invest in better gear and get a a scale that would have taken us a long time to get on our own. What about like? the team or was it you guys at this stage just going hell for leather and not seeing a lot of each other except um, for at work? Yes. <laughs> um, Stuart did work very hard. Um, a lot of, uh, nights at home on my own. There was one time when, um, Stuart had gone out west, um, of Moray and Ruby, our eldest, um, he came home and she ran the other way because he'd been away for three weeks or something out there. Um, and there's always the story that he just took his swag and a loaf of bread and a bottle of water. Um, so. How accurate is that story, Stuart? Some of it. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we, we got a fair bit done. Uh, but no, from, uh, we always tended to have a, l a little bit of help. Uh, and, and then that, that quickly grew as the scale grew. And it very quickly became about the people and will remain always about the people around us. And that's both working in the business and on the business. So from very early on, we've had a supportive um, people helping us on the business. It was a, not a governance board, but a, a board that would help us. Um, and other, other people that would come and oversee what we're doing or guide us. And of course, you've got your people within your business to make it work on a day-to-day -day basis. So from a long time ago, it's been always about the people. Yeah. Interesting. Can I, can I just ask, so what's the, how would you guys describe your roles that each of what you guys do, I guess, within the business? Now? Yeah. Today we have various businesses, I guess, and different, um, um, not enterprises, but different businesses, I guess, within what we do, we employ staff that do a lot of that. Um, like from the outside to to the book work and all the cash management and all decision making, financing, all those sorts of things. But I probably do our personal stuff and get involved with overseeing it. Yeah, and, the strategies. Um, the just bouncing ideas off Stuart, or he bounces ideas off me, and I have an opinion that um, he may think about or not. <laughs> and um, I guess just being there as another figure 
Is that about right? I mean, I am on boards and I am I'm involved in all of the different businesses, but um, more keep a backseat role, I guess these days compared to in the past. Yeah. Mm. So, what did your roles look like as as the businesses? Well, yeah, as the businesses have evolved. Ex- yeah. Um. Well, I read. I guess my background was a. I'm not an accountant, but I was bookkeeping sort of thing. Um, so I did all our book work um, up until our youngest was uh, born. That's right, yeah. Um, so that's 11 years ago. And then that was when we employed our first office staff okay. um, out here on the farm. And then that morphed and grew to a lot, lot more. Um, that was a hard a hard time to, it was hard for me to give up a lot of that, but it sort of did a big circle and I was quite happy to give it up in the end. And then I slowly, as the kids have got older, come back in in different stages, I guess. Um, yeah. So, but always a sounding board and overseeing it and involved, go to meetings and all those sorts of things. Had a lot of partnerships along the way. Lyndall's been instrumental in, you know, helping keep those partnerships together. Yeah. yeah. So, um, Lyndall, for you, what was it? So, and I think this is something which I find really fascinating with people and I've learned a little bit with my job is like, you think, yeah, if you bring someone else in to do a lot of the stuff that you've been doing, that maybe your role becomes redundant. How, how did that then shift for you? Like, did you very quickly actually end up quite occupied with that higher level strategic thinking within the businesses? Um, I think you, you do, um, I guess uh, I was very much in mothering mode as well, but um, and also my nature, accountant nature. So I was probably more in the weeds a lot of the time, and that was where my capabilities were. I guess um, not and big picturey would be um, in words, maybe not in figures. Is that right, Stuart? Um, I'd be more. Yeah, big picture in that way, I guess, and in the actual um, financial sense, more in a yeah. direction. Directions did, did it feel and decisions. Right? Was and, the right people. Is yeah, it something that's sustainably, you know, commercially sustainable as well as in general. Is is it the right way to be going? Yeah. So. I'm going to jump back to, so the contracting stage, you guys had, had structured it. So you were buying inputs, which is genius. Um, at what stage did it start to go, that the need go from being about supporting others to then actually going and, and starting to grow your own enterprises? Uh, pr- pr- pretty early on, contract didn't last too long Yeah, because we became very um, customer, customer focused and we started, started dealing uh, direct with end users that we were growing the commodities of. Mm-hmm. So customer demand driven agriculture is our phrase we often hear talk about. And it was at that point that A, I started to spend a lot more time focused on that myself. But B, it was more about how can we grow and facilitate and create a a product within a bulk commodity that had something different, something that they were able to either tell a story about or get an economical advantage of because it was stored differently or treated differently or, uh, you know, grown differently. And so once that started happening, it was more about collecting, um, not, not so much the contracting, but more about do, doing it more for us our, ourselves initially, and then bring on lots of other partners that we went in and leasing and purchasing land, et cetera. So you talk like it was quite easy. Was it easy to get a foot at the table of, of ultimately the end customers? Well, it's, ne- it's never easy. Yeah. It takes you go, a, it's a long journey generally. Yeah, well, how did you go about it? Because you made it seem like it was quite just, yeah, just happened. No, I think uh, one, one key factor has been is knowing your customer's customer. Okay. Yeah. And after you talk to them, then you come back to your customer and say, I think what you're ultimately looking for, or would this be an advantage knowing that that's all, you know, what, what they are after talking to. And, and I think that was one thing that people weren't, no, they were just saying to their customer, what would you like, or how can I give you this, as opposed to offering something that you knew ultimately was going to help them 
by intrinsically knowing your customer's customer. I think that's one point that is I've always relied upon to help get in the door. And so like what kind of commodity or what kind of products and who are the customers we're talking so about? So in that in particular case, you were talking to your customer might be the malt house, uh-huh. but their customer is the brewer. And so exactly what is the brewer looking for that you're able to provide to your customer being the malt house? Yeah, It's right. going to help them. And so really kind of, I guess, trying to identify problems as such and being like, well, we've actually already, or we can address that for you. Yeah, can address that. And then uh, trying to be involved in the majority of the steps of the supply chain. So I think that's quite, quite an important part. It helps, it helps you right back at the farm, harvest efficiencies and, and what you're doing on that front through to um, having a level of input and control on how it's been stored, through to how it's been transported, and how the data today, it's as much about the data flow with that right the way through. It's got to be seamless data flow capture of that data and present it in a format that is customized to each individual customer. Mm-hmm. And that, that identifying exactly what that is, is where the, where the trick is. Where the fun is. Can you give me an example of what that like might look like as a bit of a so, so one will be, a, if you're talking to a malt house or equivalent, they're, they're, they're a processing. So what can make their processing more efficient? How do you narrow the bell curve to allow less to be fall outside? And if that saves them a percentage of power or a percentage of water usage or something on that front, then so, that's going to create a, a large benefit for that. Going back a step, processor. it's for example, um, the, um, the criteria of your grain that you're testing when you get it out of the paddock. Mm-hmm. So that's what you're talking about being, if it's a particular protein or a, yeah. A specific um, specification that they're looking for. We can get um, so many tons that they want that fits that particular beer. Yep. Um, that sort of thing, I guess, is because that's what they're. Say. If you go to the bar today, you've got so many taps mm-hmm. of beer available to you. So if you then think back through the supply chain, at some point that becomes a nightmare for somebody to create the way to create all those different di- different types of beers. So it actually starts back at the sewing rig, which then, which then moves through to the storage, which then moves through to the malt house and onto the brewery, how you enable all those taps to turn up on the, uh, at the bar, oh. as an example. And so it will, like, I guess, and that's where it becomes so complex, doesn't it? So, and how, how did you guys, or how have, have you, and do you identify who, whose problem that you're going to kind of help solve and, and how do you actually address that kind of practically in your operations? Well, I think, uh, within the operation, number one is you try, we, we call it pillar crop focused. So you try to focus on a pillar crop and not try to be the best or, or be across everything that you are able to grow on your farm down to that level. So we've got a few, and you know, in particular ours is around the malting and it's barley and sorghum. Mm-hmm. And then they're the ones that you dive away a lot deeper into and get a, a lot better understanding and form better partnerships as opposed to trying to do it on the six or seven commodities you might be trying to produce on your farm. Gotcha. So it's a specialization of a single does that, how does it, how do you then manage risks? Like, and I guess that's by going narrower, how do you offset your risks with fluctuations and, and whatever else? Yeah. So I, th- I think you can do it over a number of different ways, depending on what it is, whether it's varieties and sowing times, you have different barleys as basic stuff through to geographical spread. Mm-hmm. That's where really our customers, uh, being the Malthouse and Brewers saying, we really like what you're doing up here in one part of Australia. Can you go and do it another? And that's where Pure Grain was formed from. And, and really all it is doing is using all the IP that we developed over the years to help other growers and connecting them directly through to the end user in, in different regions. So therefore, the one Malthouse, which is in different states, uh, can know or have confidence that the exact same product done with the exact same data recording is going to turn up in WA the same as Vic, the same as Northern New South Wales. Because 
although I don't have control over the growers, the mm -hmm. the uh, way that they're doing it and how they're recording it and is is all the same across a very large geographical area. And so how, because I would say um, amongst friends and, and different people, there, there is like a, an underlying like competitiveness with neighbours and things like that, where you guys sit when you're trying to deal directly in with customers. Like how, how, have, how have you balanced, I guess, that, that sharing of IP knowledge um, because that's actually your competitive advantage? Yeah. I, I don't know if I, I just sum it, I just straight transparency. Uh-huh. I think if you can be, the more transparent you are, the, you know, less, less, um, sheets and veils and, and don't be a trader. Yep. And you can just be transparent and say, well, this is, this is how it should and could work and the way it should be. And it's not everyone's cup of tea, right? You're removing mm. yourself a long way from the growing of the crop. Yeah. So I don't know if it's really to say that it's a competitive advantage to go deeper into the supply chain unless you're that way inclined and wanting to want, wanting to do that. I, I think it's a more sustainable model mm -hmm. and I think there's definitely advantages in it, but it's not, I wouldn't suggest it's for everyone. If you went around all your neighbours, how many would want to go down that path? I don't know. No, but also with your um, transparency and with pure um, like your LTAs and OTAs, you're actually imparting this information. You, well, we yeah, are being transparent and sharing yeah. it so they can be part of it as well. Yeah, um, so we, we've offered it. We've continued on a very large, to, to lots of people everywhere. Yeah. And for those who are inter interested and into it and, and want to be, want to know where their commodity is going to, then they're, they're the ones that tend, tend to come on board and others that are more just for today or the price driven, et cetera, then yeah, they're, they're not necessarily ones that want to come along the journey. Yeah. Before we chat about pure grain, I was going to ask you, Stuart, because I'm, what part or yeah, what part of business farming, the grain industry are you most like, what, what, where's, where does your true passion lie? No, it's in the business. It's the business side. Yeah, it I just don't happened. think it matters which, which part of it. Yeah. Okay. It's just, it's the, uh, it's the wanting to make something more efficient, uh -huh. wanting to take it in a sustainable way that I can see will continue on mm -hmm. and the, the, the drive to create something that makes value for both customer and the grower and that'll outlast Lyndall and I. Because it's it's a it's a cracking model, that would be the end goal. Yeah, but over the years, it's like going back. I'm not current now. It's like um, there's a new challenge, and so Stuart would have to accomplish that challenge, succeed at that challenge, make it work no matter what, and kill all the paradigms or not be frightened of what other people think. Mm -hmm. But once he's done it. Then it's the next one. And it's the next one. And it's the next one. Chase so, next one. Yeah, it is. So Get it's out. been like that over the years. It's, I thought I was just marrying a farmer and having four kids and living on a farm. <laughs> but it hasn't quite, like, it's, it's, it's been um, uh, an exciting, yeah, period. So, and um, how, have you, how do you guys approach that need to stay focused on the here and now? But actually, then, because obviously you are really a big picture. Anything's kind of possible. I think it's who you surround yourself with, the the team you develop, uh, and 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 give them as much buy in and and part of it as they they want to be. So my management style is is not to stand over and watch, and it's it's to give a lot of you know width and scope for them to. And it, so some people like that and one, some don't. So you end up with people surrounding you that are really into the taking the bull by the horns and doing that themselves. That allows them to focus on what they're, they're wanting to and what they're good at. Mm -hmm. And and with bringing like people like that into the business, does it, does it always look like, is it in a, is it in a monetary equity way or is it actually just in that people really thrive on that ownership of role and opportunity? 
What's up to our scale? We've done it. Individualized it however they want. Okay. Yeah. Because for some people, it's that's over know, the years, a, a yeah. vehicle or a house or something that's very important to them. Yep. And others, it's definitely equity in the business, and and so we've we've got all facets. Yeah. Cool. And is that something? Like, I'm just we're just going on a huge tangent here. Is that like it was the equity side of things something which was difficult to weigh up? Like whether you bring in those extra shareholders yeah, or not? Never for me. It always is for me. Well, you just give it away. What's that? You just give it away. Oh yeah, yeah. Lock, you, lock them down. You, you're gonna you're gonna grow it. I believe you will grow it so much quicker and more successfully with with skin in the game. Uh huh. Yep. Yeah, with people having skin in the game. And what do you reckon, Linda? Oh no, I agree. It's just it's harder for me to let go. <laughs> yeah. Sometimes. Because lots of people would be fearful of that. I'll say the share. Not the shareholder takeover, but that potential, well, it might be power and, and that decision making ability that comes in. Like, is there, yeah. Well, so, it, so in our time, we've never seen that. Okay. You, you can give as much as you, they're either not wired that way or that's not the reason they're wanting the equity or it's not the reason it's going to get them out of bed. Yeah. They just want to have it or that they're wanting to see it as opposed to, I want to overtake us or the leader of the group, mm -hmm. as an example. I, I'm not saying there wouldn't be anywhere, but I haven't necessarily come across it. And to be challenged by some people that are, you know, going closer to wanting to do that, it's a good, it's healthy. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to be, you, you want to be challenged. And the more you can get challenged within your group, I reckon it's pretty, pretty cool. And if, oh, and I guess if they're coming from a position where they are owners and they're really coming from it where they've, it's a vested interest in yeah. what's best for the business. Yeah. And so I, I, I always think it's, and as long as you've got the growth continuing, then uh, I don't see it as a pediment to our well-being. Um, I was going to ask for you guys, like where you sit now, what does, what does, or what did success look like back in the beginning? What was the dream? Ah, uh, well, it was to own land and, you know, ha have Cropping and cattle production, et cetera, um, over, over a scale. Mm -hmm. you know, and to give you some idea, you know, I love the Sydney Kidman book, like most kids that are into agriculture. Yeah. You know, that big drought proofing yourself and all that sort of stuff. So um, I, I would have thought it would be something around that. And that's still the dream? I think the dream's now slightly more focused. <laughs> <laughs> Less horses and cattle. <laughs> Oh, but yeah, and, and more more around uh, creating that sustainable supply chain as opposed to just the growing of the commodity. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And getting these partnerships, it's the partnerships and the relationships between end user, supply chain and grower, I, th I think is the absolute key, especially as it more into the, um, a carbon economy and a, and a social and environmental, the whole ESG. It's both sides needing educating. Us as growers need educating just as much about the issues and the troubles they're having to raise capital as they are about the realities of, you know, what's happening out here. So everything from what you, you're doing in human agriculture is excellent through to exactly what I spend most of my time doing is educating both, both sides. And, and I think that's a, a challenge. But B, if you get that right, and we've seen it and got some relationships right, it, it, it creates the most sustainable pathway for that commodity to go. Gotcha. And what about for you, Lyndall? Um, my success, prob um, what success looks like is I'm much more on the family side. So it's having the family around um, and supporting my husband in whatever endeavours he wants to do, basically. Um, but being challenged and I, uh, we always enjoy not being um, the status quo, I guess, always doing something a little bit different. Um, and I guess we sort of thrive on that and like that in a way. Hmm. Yeah. Um, but yeah, more, more, I'm more on the home front, I guess. So keeping that on the straight and narrow. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Stuart, we were chatting the other day on the phone and you mentioned something and it was around like, well, the, the customer, what was it? Well, customer you said demand driven ag. Customer, div- customer demand driven ag. But there was something else about, I guess, your approach to, to business that you mentioned. So it would well, obviously is that, that customer first, but like in the, this world of, um, that you guys are operating in. And I'll say anecdotally, I heard a story of a brewer up in Queensland needing malt barley and they were taking the malt from Geelong up All the way up there. Which just, when you think of carbon miles, all of that just doesn't make any sense. But it, but then at the same time too, is the, is that end user going to be more pissed off that they can't buy Great Northern on tap or that it's not carbon neutral? How do you, like, and where you sit, what are you seeing? in these conversations um, and is there one lever that's pulling harder than another? Yeah, I think, I think it's been one of our biggest challenges and you touched on it before to say, how do you know where to get to the right people within the business? Because you can have high level executive teams uh, at a saying or wanting something around ESGs or et cetera, which is totally different to the procurement team. Mm-hmm. And that, that, that is definitely a challenge to try and work your way through, through that because the procurement team's KPI to meet their budget and do what they've got to do. And that is, is that aligned necessarily with what the executive team is trying to meet on an ESG? You know, you, you can often feel as though you're the meat in the sandwich there. Yeah. You know, in a business that you have really um, shouldn't you end up trying to manage, manage, uh, manage that relationship between, between those two. Yeah. But you, it, within their own business. Yeah. Oh God. Yeah. But, uh, mediator. <laughs> be, be, but once again, if you, if you are able to get it right, it, 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 it's a winner. Yeah. And, and some, some companies are better at it than others. And they're ultimately the ones you end up partnering with more the ones that do do it well. Have you guys had any false starts with, with businesses? And, and I guess, cause if certainly could have grown a lot quicker and a lot faster if we weren't so picky and choosy. So if they're not, we, we, we identify where values created in the supply chain and believe it should be shared equitably mm-hmm. as to taking on the risk. And if different companies don't want to do that, well, then they're not the right fit for us. You know, a very small example of that is the farmer has some critical data that the farmer has that the end user is able to leverage off and the end user is not willing to give them anything for that data, then why should they hand it over? Are they really the ultimate partner there? Yeah. That, that type of type of thing. And, that, and that's where you hang down the traditional trading model where one takes all yeah. based on the risk of the trade. Do, do you think we're going to see a, a shake up of that? more traditional model or is it, do you think we're at a stage where there's, there's comfort and efficiencies as things are, and we kind of just keep going without a, a real shake up? No, I, I, I think you're constantly seeing little bits of it. It's not a seismic shift necessarily straight away. Mm-hmm. If you look at how many branded beef brands there are now, that, that's the start of it yep. to a certain extent. And in, and in the grain, it's a small steps on farm storage. And it's big in some areas and, and probably going to be, you know, growing in others that aren't necessarily, you know, the longer term thinking end users that either A, want to and see the benefit of having some of the data now and, and want to understand it and what are the true costs of, say, regenerative agriculture, then, then they'll, they'll have no choice in one way but to get to understand the grower and there's only a few ways of doing that. Mm. How, how to how to really um, form that relationship. Whereas there'll be plenty plenty of others that won't won't see the advantage in that or don't have that longer term mindset. So so where do you see it in say twenty odd years? Well, I don't think the the bigger getting bigger is going to change. Mm-hmm. So I see a lot more direct direct end user relationships happening for sure. And that's how people will be getting, I'll say their scale as such, like their, their value. Yeah. Now, generalizing here, Australia still exports 
you know, 90% of what we produce. So yeah. you have to do it at a scale where you can do it, you know, to, and, and this is where you're getting different groups or different like-minded people come together to try and do it, et cetera. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think there'll be many ways of being able to, able to achieve that without necessarily knowing your end user customer straight away. So can you, can you explain to us a little bit about what is Pure Grain? How was it set up and who's involved today? Yeah, it was set up to um, be that linkage between the grower and the end user yep. in a transparent model. And uh, it is in all grain growing regions of Australia. Mm -hmm. It has both domestic and export customers that, that the grower is within the network provide. And providing their managing the commodity they're growing and the data, then the customer has, you know, a lot of a lot of uh, satisfaction on the road, but a lot of comfort that what he's ordering is going to turn up. Yeah, assurance. Yeah, a lot of assurance because it's the same way it's been done over different different regions and areas. Yeah, gotcha. Has that been something which is difficult to? To manage, or it really was working out, I'll say the model of how it worked with a little bit of the model, and then trying to enact that in different regions has been been a bit more of a challenge. Yeah. And education, education, well, people. But, but you've got to show the value. Education of um, participants within pure grain, or yeah. within the education of both, both, yeah, both. I mean, I mean, growers and and end users in WA, as you would imagine, would be. You know, a lot different education there to a northern New South Wales grower, yeah, and a Queensland domestic user. And that, for for you, how do you stay across like that, or do you really let the kind of I'll say the localities, like those local areas, really manage because they know their systems and how it works? It's, it's the local areas with the you know tried and proven formula that's worked. What have you got to tweak in the in the different areas, and how much? Do you have to change the model to, to suit versus how much is through the education? Gotcha. Yeah. So what's on for you guys for the next few years here? Uh, no, well, well, I mean, we've got the pure that we're trying to grow. Yep. Um, we also have our other entity, um, Buller Farms, which is our contracting entity. What's land service management. Land service management. And then um, we have another a combined northern venture. Um, which is bringing in your external um, property owners and uh, spreading risk and farming country from, well, at the moment from, I don't know, northern New South Wales to Canada. Um, but it's a very different and new concept that um, to get investors into this co-farming um, arrangement. <laughs> so, to, so as in there, like absent... Like yeah, so that generally are not. absentee landholders, mm -hmm. and it's a way of getting their land managed, yep, and spreading their risk to level out their return somewhat because they're exposed to a lot larger geographical spread mm -hmm. and a lot more commodities and both irrigation and rain fed country. So you become part of the co farm model by um, being a percentage of the model based on your land or water assets that you bring in. Okay. And so that you are then a percentage of everybody's commodity that's growing on, on all the different land around. And so, for example, you could be managing a, a farm just down the road here that gets a hail and the crop gets wiped out. Um, and so ordinarily in the old ways, the simple terms, no income. But if that's getting spread between all those the risk is everyone's taking that risk on. Gotcha. But so you could get a, a bumper crop in the south. So it's more, um, it is for, I'll say, smaller landholders. But no, just have some tea. We've got some very large landholders. Yeah. Just so a it, way of getting their land managed. Because once you invest in that land, you're either going to lease it or mm -hmm. put on your own management. Yep. And so. Oh, because people are trying to land bank as such, as in they're purchasing the, the yeah. asset to, yep. to hold. They're either it. purchasing the land or they've inherited land or they've. Want, want to go to a different land area, yeah. how do they get it managed? How do they get it run? Mm -hmm. Either going to pay someone to do it or le lease it out, whereas this provides a way of still being part of the growing of the 
whatever the commodity. Yeah. We're always end user focus. So you'll get a relationship immediately if you want to get that far into it. Yeah. As in the owner of the land can come and meet all the different end users that we're dealing directly with. And you're part of a, a lot larger community of growers that, and that have a like-minded, I suppose, reason that why, why they're invested in land. Yeah, gotcha. The management group uh, gets paid, it predominantly gets paid off the percentage of profit. So it's in their incentive to, um, to do it, to make, make this, make profitable decisions because mm-hmm. that's how they're getting paid. And yeah, I think the growth of this will, growth of that co-farming venture will be, um, what will you really focusing over the next few years? That's because cool. the bigger you get the geographical spread, the more consistent you can get the return. Yeah. And so say if I was to come in, um, so us and one other, I come in and I've got a large cattle herd. You guys come in as a grain operators, but based off, I'll say my land, I might end up with 50% of the units myself. And then we have this that's person. Right. Gotcha. That's genius. So currently there's, uh, nine, nine entities. Yeah. Uh, 400 and 408 million of, um, land under management. Yep. And which is around 20, 26 and a half thousand hectares. And, uh, it's in both irrigation, rain fed, sort of Bruce Creek to North Star. Yeah. But yeah, hopefully, um, expanding that a lot, a long way further soon. Wow. That's cool. Is this, is the ideas and things that you guys do, are they, I said, concocted from other parts of the world, other industries that you see things like this work and go, how can we apply that into ag and into our area? Mm, not, not, not so much. It's more, what, what is the more efficient or better way of doing it mm-hmm. as, as much as anything? And in some cases, some of that we were doing in a, a minor way. But a very not small way, then you make it a lot larger and commercial. Commercialized, yeah. Um, but then, I mean, you have great mentors that throw around ideas and and great staff that yeah, throw would, around I would, ideas. We definitely would say takes, not all the ideas that come from it's not like off. It doesn't oh. like it comes overnight. It's a lot of, a lot of. Um, That's genius though. What, what's a better way of doing it? You know, how do you, and so where did this really come from was the uh, um, 18, 19 drought. Mm-hmm. You know, our, our diversity and geographical spread, et cetera, was what one could say was not big enough to handle that level of drought. That, that was. Probably the question on the, or the discussion point on the board paper would have been, how do we mitigate the risk on the, that's where it starts Mm -hmm. and then morphs into the KFAR model after a long, long time of getting it going better and better. But, and then once you get it to a commercial, like then, then you can really roll it out. And along that journey, you bring, you bring along the people who, who else is really keen to see a more sustainable way of absentee running of land as an ex- yeah, and they, yeah, and they're into it and say, right, you come along and they help drive and be part of forming it, be part of the furniture then of the venture. And so f- for you, I'm, I'm well, that is just so interesting and cool. H- how do you, and I'm guessing it's coming back to people, but how do you split your time between the things that are demanding both of your attention and family's obviously part of that as well. <laughs> <laughs> family's number one, but then it's just where the, where, where you're focusing growth for that particular period mm-hmm. is where I'll put, put more attention to. And probably back in the day where you're doing the physical hours now, it's just office hours and you do get up exceptionally early most mornings. And, um, so yeah, it, when we say exceptionally early, oh, well, not that early, but <laughs> I'm a four four thirty starter, and I'm yeah. not. <laughs> mm. um, and straight into it. Yeah, I do it till till six, and do some exercise, and then have breakfast with the family, and yeah, that, that's that's my day. But I'm shot duck by about nine o'clock. Eight more pm. And I, I think you're just driven, and you when you're going, you're going, and. Um, like we were talking about over lunch, we 
have specific family things that we like doing where we can turn off um, and and we do enjoy that. Um, but but we're not the, very good at turning off. <laughs> no, no. Some of the growth has been around your customers' issues, right? Take that 18, 19 drought. That, that discussion I just had around where co-farming came after the drought, the first part was, well, how are we going to get, you know, old barley to our customers? And that's where we started doing the coastal shipping where we sourced it in different parts of Australia and, and then facilitated the unloading of the vessels into Brisbane. Mm -hmm. And that started to do two, two vessels, 60,000 ton. And that, that, that would have seen our customer there. But as the drought continued on and more people hurt and you want to do more, you know, once you're there, get it going, commercialized, we ended up doing just under 1.2 million ton. Wow. What started as one, site. one one phone call about how do we go about in and we ended up with five five sites. Yeah, five sites. Five sites out at Pink and Bar in Brisbane. Um and a big team of people, which which a lot of them came from the areas around where we lived so that didn't have any work. During the drought as well. Kept the gear going, kept people employed. Because was it you guys that loaded the train directly? Yeah. So once again that was uh a customer thing because that particular end user could um, couldn't really take it in by road. Mm -hmm. It was it was a train delivery system, and yet lots of other things we were doing. We really wanted they really you know wanted the product, so it was then well, surely it can't be that hard to to do it. So then you go and figure out how to get a train loading license in how different locations, and yeah, and um work around all the loopholes and, and get there. Yeah. So that, that became a great, and still is today, a very, um, be beneficial learnings, both that and the coastal shipping, which, um, build up of IP industry knowledge and et cetera, to allow you to, um, benefit in a lot, lot of ways and business where attracting people, because well, look what these guys have done or yeah. The ability to work in this part and that part, different parts. Yep. If there was, I guess, one, one, one thing that you could change or implement that would give you guys overnight, I guess, opportunity to leapfrog ahead. Is there, is there one thing, if you had a magic bond that you could do anything that comes to mind? No, not other than predict the future, but <laughs> <laughs> done. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> No, I, I don't spend a lot of time thinking about that. Yeah, type because of it's thing. Just, just play with the I rules think, that are given. I think, yeah. and too, Stuart's very much a person. If <laughs> if that option doesn't work, he he might be down for a day, but you just pick yourself up and you work on the next option. Yeah. Like so, I mean, there would you'd love for some of those things to have come off, but um, I think then so. they're not going to happen. Like not every. I think trying to set, trying trying to set, trying to guess next trends like i'm i mean the data is around the esg and um environmental reporting etc i think that has been coming for a while yeah as an example so how do you get your business and get every ready to be able to um give what your customers are going to need there in time as an example that's going it's taken probably the most amount of our time energy and effort for something that's can can I my hand in my heart and say I'm getting extra dollars today versus what we've spent on it, and I'd say no. But that's that's a belief that the group feels is going to be needed. And how do you segregate yourself everywhere else? There, how are you going to meet your customers' demands in in a time backing what you think will be trends? I suppose, and you definitely call that a mega trend, or I would anyway. Yeah. And so moving pretty early on those to put yourself and business in a better position, yeah, I think is quite important. And um, one of those trends areas is obviously in and around carbon and with you guys dealing with customers, especially closer to the consumer would be fascinating. But um, what, like, what's your, I guess, feeling take on it at the moment in terms of the whole I'll say the carbon neutrality piece, but then actually how farmers are going to be rewarded and have that 
I guess, yeah, if the... If you take, if you take the super long-term view, I'd say pretty difficult on our fragile Australian soils to have make monoculture work longer term. So that's at a very high level. So you're going to have to be doing something, I believe, in time somewhere down the track to enable that sustainable practice of farming to continue. So I've been saying we've had no livestock here since the 70s. Do I think there'll be no livestock here or no pasture phase or no something different to the way we're doing it today, even in 10 years time, I'd suggest not. Mm -hmm. I, I just don't think it's sustainable the way we're doing. Yeah. And I, I'd not suggest that's on the majority of monoculture farms around Australia, our country, our land and weather and everything is not, I just don't think it's conducive enough to it. Now, will there be, along the way, there'll be super great things that'll come along that'll help probably prolong that, you know, just like the, the no-till farming. I mean, no one would, no one would say that the way we were farming in the seventies and eighties was sustainable. Yeah. No-till farming has bought us an extra bunch of years, but I don't believe that's the be all and end all. It's not, we can do it like this forever. So I, I think Land usage change um, in different parts will be the key w well down the track. Yeah. And I think, oh, I think it's such an interesting point that like the utopia and there's no end point really in yeah. agriculture and practices. It's like what we, as the beauty of learning, it's what we did. It's like, how on earth do we ever do that? And that's the beauty of history. But it's like, yeah, with the way we farm and do things today is definitely going to be different in the future. It's definitely going to be different. No, I was just going to say, in on along that learning and different um, paths, this farm particularly here um, with Pure, we're turned into like a trial farm um, and are dealing with about five different parties um, doing lots of different trials mm -hmm. with non-synthetics and different rates and all those sorts of things, but doing it in a way that it's... Um, commercial trials, they're real, um, what large a farmer, scale. large scale. It's yeah. not just in a, a lab or in a little plot. Um, yeah, so that's another path that we've gone down just recently, which is really interesting. And um, we're probably a third year. Th third year into year, it. Yeah. So 420 only. hectares dedicated 100% to large scale trials. Okay. And uh, we, with both production parties involved, people that have got productivity benefits or, um, but also end users trying to understand as well. Yeah. We've always had that type of bend, I, I believe. Mm. And, you know, for a long time we had our own in-house, in-house own R&D. Person. Yep. We've had, and really that's what mm. other people have been along the way. Don't say yeah. the names, but we've yep. had that, yep. I think, at least for 10 years now. Yeah. Wow. Mm. Because I... A, I, to understand ourselves, have a better understanding, but B, to be able to promote that to others, Yep, I think is quite important. So if we were to say like through the sustainability lens, how far out are you guys, how far do you look in, into kind of the, the future of what you guys are trying to achieve? I think at least five, five to the 10 year range. Yep. Mm -hmm. Well, we spend most of the time. So, um, and... This is far easier. What's your favourite grain-based dish? What was that? Grain-based? Grain-based dish. Oh, gosh. Can I, oh, uh, can I say bread? I like oh, bread. Yeah. You can. <laughs> Absolutely, you can. Someone said beer. That I was, was going to say yeah. beer. Yeah, another, that was my other thought. We've got to say beer because we produce. Like, and we... then a, another person said grain-fed beef, and I was like, okay, well, yeah, yeah, we yeah. Get, <laughs> we're starting to really I was just going to go straight for beer. Pasta, yeah. pasta. Okay. Yeah. So if you could have any three people past or present around for Bread and beer. Who would you guys invite? So we can have six at this dinner party. <laughs> <laughs> That's a hard one, don't you think? We can go I, through I, the three. I, I, got, I got some random. <laughs> yeah, we'll say them because I've got no it idea. Could be anyone. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Well, one. One would be um, Jim Collins. <laughs> yeah. Because I, I just love some of the books he's written. He's one of the most interesting people. So that's yeah. a bit out there. <laughs> your, no, your, your, I don't know. I don't know. Don't have it. Okay. Um, like Stuart's got a couple here. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. What Who's about the say? author of your um, good to great book? That's Jim. Oh, is that him? Is it? Yeah. Oh, okay. Right. Yeah. 
I didn't know that. Um, oh, I don't. Yeah, I might have come back to you. On we'll that. come back to that. Yeah, okay. okay. Come back to that one. Maybe an easy one. What's something you both have on your bucket list? Yeah, we've, we've both got to go to. Oh, I want to go to South yeah, Africa and see the, the top five. Yeah. The, um, wildlife. Yeah. It's amazing. That's, yeah. I went in 2019. Yeah. Can highly recommend Kruger National Park. Mm. So that's Insane. On my, that, that's on our that's bucket list. Yeah. 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 I think that's it. And I've never, we've never been and we've never done any business or anything in South Africa. Yeah. Probably to do more pleasurable trips or actually me to actually go on trips with my husband because I never go because of the kids. Mm -hmm. <laughs> there we go. We'll write that one down. <laughs> um, I, I can't recommend South Africa highly enough. It was incredible. And I think what was also really interesting, because I'll, I'll say I naturally think of things through an ag perspective. So although we're in mm. like these nature reserves seeing, so there was this lion who had been in a big fight and was absolutely cooked but it was actually how interesting nature when it's yeah. left to do nature things can be really cruel but also like really interesting as well um can imagine yeah it's so good i'd go back in a heartbeat that'd be my favorite place i've ever been well there you go yeah i think on your bucket list would be to do some more heli skiing yeah with, yeah, with the always. family <laughs> as a family gets it's pretty cool skiing with your kids yeah i bet yeah yeah it's, that's a hard one, I find, mm. because I don't have, I, don't, I guess we don't well, have ideas of. you think of some of the of... musicians that we like and stuff that, you know, <laughs> I'd like to have a bit of a yarn to. Some of the musicians? Yeah. Who would be a musician? <laughs> Anyone from the Beatles? Oh, yeah. Get them around for dinner. Mm -hmm. Okay. How the hell does bloody Paul McCartney, at his age, just knock out those concerts? Two hour concerts, well, what three about hour Elton concerts. John? Yeah. Yeah. Robbie Worms, he'd be interesting. Yeah. That's what I mean. Any of those guys are pretty cool. <laughs> um, well, I don't think, well, I don't really have a whole lot else. One question I do ask people, and I think um, it's on the Humans of Ag podcast, but it's around advice to year 10 students. And I'd be really interested in each of yours. Like you, you both have come from such an, you've both come from ag background, but have gone down such an interesting journey. What would you guys say to people about the opportunities in agriculture today? Oh, firstly, I think the opportunities are endless because virtually any career can be tuned into ag and you can be located anywhere doing that. Um, I mean, okay, if you want to be hands-on, maybe not, but, and that sort of is true even with our business because we have people from Victoria to Queensland to wherever working for us. Um, and, and I think... I don't know what else. Um, I sort of think that options are endless. Don't sweat getting the marks. If you want to get somewhere and you have a plan and a drive and a goal, you will get there no matter what. Might be the long way around. Um, I mean, we've got four kids. We've got one left school, one going into year eleven, and they're all going to do different paths. I'm sure. Um, I'm sure they'll get to wherever they want to be, no matter what. Um, I think education is about learning how to learn. And once, once you've done that, then it's about where you want to get to, how you want to get there, when you want to get there. A lot of people don't know that. So stay in the education system until they're working that out. But if you have that fully planned, I'd say get into it. I've got one question just on that because you're, I'd say you're absolutely a, a learner for life. How did you go convincing your parents and others that you were ready to, <laughs> that you were re uh, ready to move on to the next style of learning? Oh, it was not a challenge at all. Yeah. Absolutely none. <laughs> but because, because if you are driven enough, then they could just see Where the passion. They, they could see it. And it's the same as it. Bring them along the journey. Not just get up one day and say, hey. Oh, but you did. Your school was surprised that you were leaving. I, mean, I didn't have to convince the bloody teachers. <laughs> <laughs> but the decision makers, being my parents and, you know, others, they, they were the ones, you know, it was always going to be. Yeah. So they, they, it wasn't a surprise to them. Yeah, wow. Just convince them, good numbers, budgets, plans. Know how to do your maths. 
can't spell still. But I mean, and, and it's that growth and, and, and drive to learn. When I first met Stuart, he didn't know one end of a tax return or knew how to budget, knew Excel. Um, but now you probably know more about corporate business than I do. Um, so, and it's through not, not doing any courses. Yeah. Cause you've learned how to learn so you can pick it up for the rest of your life. Um, so it's very hard for us then to tell our children that they have to go to uni or they have to do a course <laughs> or they have to have. Times have changed. Yeah. <laughs> yeah I don't know. The fundamental principles are still the same. My word, my <laughs> word. And uh, I don't have an issue facing it. They'll be, they'll know when they're ready. Yeah, great. Well, thank you so much for sitting down for this chat. Well, I think I'm just sitting here just going, well, anything's possible really. And the mindset and how you guys have gone about achieving it, it's incredible. And I think it'll be so interesting to watch and see what happens over the next few years and into the future as well. So thank you so much for sitting down. Thanks, Ollie. Thanks, Ollie. And thanks for doing what Human Jack Culture do, trying to get the message out there. I think it's a very important part of it. And always, they're always stimulating um, chats that you have, yeah. No, I think it was very cool sitting around the, the table at lunch and having you guys rattling off episodes. It's cool. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thank you.